Hello Biology 400 people, this is Mr. Gales and today I'm bringing you another screencast for organic chemistry. This is session number four and we're going to focus today on the chemistry of lipids. As a reminder, please make sure that you have your organic chemistry packet with you so that you can take down detailed notes of what we'll discuss today in this screencast. Uh, those notes should be in two column note format. You're going to put your main ideas on the left hand side. Main ideas will be ideas that are underlined uh, usually at the top of the screen. There may be some occasional main ideas that are underlined within the screen text. On the right hand side you're going to put down all of your supporting details, definitions, uh, examples, key ideas. You might include some drawings of, of key molecules that we point out. Okay, so let's begin by kind of introducing what lipids are. Lipids are um, very similar in terms of their chemistry to carbohydrates in terms of the atoms that they contain. You can tell that you're looking at a lipid if you have uh, something in front of you that contains carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Now unlike the carbohydrates that you learned about from Mr. Workman's screencast, um, in a lipid you're going to see lots of carbon and hydrogen atoms but only a few oxygen atoms. Uh, that contrasts with the carbohydrates. We saw an equal number of carbon and oxygen uh, and twice as many hydrogen. But in lipids, lots and lots of carbon and hydrogen and very few oxygen. Lipids are commonly called fats, uh, oils, or waxes. So these are the, the group of molecules which we re typically refer to as fats. Um, and oftentimes lipids are described as the most diverse uh, group of organic molecules. They're diverse hydrophobic molecules. That's what makes them uh, stand out, what makes them so unique. Lipids, generally speaking, are the major type of organic molecules that are primarily hydrophobic. Now, The picture that you're seeing here on this slide highlights a very typical type of lipid or fat known as a triglyceride. Triglycerides are what we commonly refer to as fat. It's the kind of fat that we see in adipose tissue. So when you've got this cute little, I don't know if that's supposed to be a groundhog or whatever it is, when you look at the, the fat that it insulates that animal's body, um, that, though, that fat is actually what we call adipose tissue, and that adipose tissue uh, contains fat droplets. It's droplets of these molecules that are called triglycerides. All right, so uh, in addition to triglycerides, which are probably the most common types of fats. Remember, we said that lipids are the diverse hydrophobic molecules. There are many different kinds of lipids in, in addition to those basic fats. Phospholipids are critical for building up cell membranes. We'll get into phospholipids a little bit later. There are steroid-based molecules. This is a, a molecule of chlorophyll, and you can see that it's got this collection of rings up at the top that's kind of a steroid type of lipid and it has this long uh, hydrophobic tail at the at the bottom of the molecule and that's for embedding it into the the membranes the thylakoid membranes of the uh, plant cells chloroplasts another type of phospholipid that we see over here this is just generally a cholesterol uh, another type of steroid molecule steroids are always going to be characterized by the rings that you see here and then finally we have uh, natural rubber, which is another type of lipid. So we have a, a diverse collection of molecules here, but one thing that they all have in common is that they're hydrophobic and you're going to expect to see lots of carbon and hydrogen. Now remember from the electronegativity rules, when you have lots of carbon and hydrogen, that's going to be rule number two of the electronegativity rules. Carbon bonding with hydrogen, there's very little difference in electronegativity. And what you end up with are nonpolar bonds, Nonpolar bonds equals hydrophobic. Right? These are molecules that are not going to interact well in water. All right, let's begin with the first major type of lipid and the, probably the most common type. We're going to talk about the triglycerides or what we commonly call fat. Triglycerides are uh, molecules that are a little bit different from other organic molecules in that they're not directly made up of repeating units but they have building blocks like all organic molecules have. So when we look at a triglyceride, the building blocks for a triglyceride include a molecule that is called a glycerol. So there's one glycerol. Glycerol is a three carbon molecule and you may deduce from the ending here, the OL ending, that it is a alcohol, it's a three carbon alcohol, and we can see here that it contains hydroxyl groups. Remember hydroxyl groups are commonly found 
in carbohydrates and in organic alcohol molecules. So here we have our three carbon building block called a glycerol molecule, three carbon alcohol. The other building blocks of triglycerides are what we call fatty acids. And in a triglyceride, tri meaning three, you have three fatty acids which serve as building blocks. Uh, fatty acids are, can be defined as long chains of carbon with a single carboxyl group. And if you remember from when we studied functional groups, carboxyl groups are carbon double bonded to oxygen and then a hydroxyl group. So there's your carboxyl group. We have a long chain of carbon with a carboxyl group. Now surrounding that carbon is always going to be hydrogens on these fatty acids. And if you see from this picture, we're going to kind of preview what we'll be looking at. The building of a triglyceride involves a condensation or dehydration synthesis reaction whereby an enzyme that's responsible for driving this reaction will remove a hydrogen atom from a glycerol from the functional group, the, the hydroxyl functional group there, and it will remove a hydroxyl group from the fatty acid. And then the bridge that the, the, the bond that's formed between them serves as the bridge between those two groups. All right, so big idea here, triglycerides, basic fats, are made up of building blocks called glycerol, one glycerol molecule, which is a three carbon molecule, and then three fatty acids, which are long chains of carbon with single carboxyl groups. Now, we do need to differentiate between two different types of fatty acids. So we're still kind of talking about triglycerides, but we have two new main ideas on this slide that we need to deal with. Fatty acids can be defined as either saturated or unsaturated depending on their chemistry. So let's begin with saturated fatty acids as our next main idea. Saturated fatty acids contain carbon to carbon single bonds. So here we see an example of a saturated fatty acid down here. And all of the carbon to carbon bonds are single bonds. And because they are single bonded, the maximum amount of hydrogen atoms based on carbon's valence number of four are filled in surrounding those carbons. All right. Uh, unsaturated fatty acids, by contrast, contain one or more carbon to carbon double bonds. And because of those double bonds, and if we take a look down here, we can see an unsaturated fatty acid. Here we have a carbon to carbon double bond here and a carbon to carbon double bond here. Because of those double bonds and the valence number of carbon being four, there are now fewer than the maximum number of hydrogen atoms that are bonded surrounding those carbons. Now remember, if this, if this double bond here were a single bond, we could add two more hydrogens in uh, to this uh, fatty acid. Now the importance of understanding the difference between sat saturated fatty acids and unsaturated fatty acids is in the way that these particular fatty acid molecules will behave chemically. They are all going to be hydrophobic. The differences will come in in terms of whether they are solid at room temperature or liquid at room temperature. Now here we're looking at again triglycerides and we're kind of contrasting those saturated fatty acids as building blocks with unsaturated fatty acids. So when we have molecules that are containing all saturated fatty acids, as we see here, we describe that as a hard fat or a saturated fat. Uh, in this case, all of the fatty acids contain uh, single bonds between the carbons. Hard fats or saturated fats are solid at room temperature. They're also a little bit harder for your body to break down. Uh, by contrast, unsaturated fatty acids or oils contain one or more uh, unsaturated fatty acids out of the three that make up the chains. And so we can see here when we have an unsaturated fatty acid as part of our triglyceride, we end up with an oil. Okay. Now, how do we build triglycerides from those building block molecules? This goes back to that first screen where we looked at the condensation reaction. Uh, the three fatty acids are going to be joined to the glycerol building block by the reaction which is known as dehydration synthesis or condensation. Those two terms mean the same thing. In this case, when we take a look at this, we can see that the glycerol molecule here as a building block, that glycerol molecule contains hydroxyl groups. And then the three fatty acids each contain carboxyl groups. 
and the dehydration synthesis reaction occurs when a, a molecule of water is removed from each of those three carbons on the glycerol and on each of those carboxyl groups on the fatty acid chains. So the formation of a triglyceride always involves one glycerol, three fatty acids, and the removal or formation of three water molecules to form that triglyceride. The bond that forms when that occurs is a strong covalent bond called an ester linkage. This is another main idea or key idea regarding triglycerides. Just as in carbohydrates we have that glycosidic linkage, which is the strong linkage between monosaccharides, the ester linkage, which I will highlight here, the ester linkage is really that strong covalent bond between the glycerol and the fatty acids. Now, overall, the functioning of fats, uh, the major function of fats is to store concentrated energy, and th that energy is, is going to be concentrated in those many carbon to hydrogen bonds. Remember, we discussed that one of the reasons that carbon is so important for living things is that it can form many bonds, and when it forms many bonds, it has the ability to store lots of energy. Fats contain almost twice as much, actually a little bit more than twice as much energy as the typical monosaccharide or carbohydrate will, gram for gram. Other functions that triglycerides provide for living things would include insulation against the cold. Obviously, you think about organisms that live in cold or arctic environments. They typically have a large uh, layer of blubber to protect them. They can also protect internal organs. They provide padding uh, and, and insulation against uh, those internal organs from being hurt. And then also waterproofing. If you consider the fact that lipids are hydrophobic, you can understand that they provide some waterproofing by uh, secreting sort of an oily layer, a, a sort of a fatty oily layer that water has a hard time uh, interacting with. All right, another type of lipid that's very important is called a phospholipid. So this would be our next main idea. Phospholipids are similar to triglycerides. They contain glycerol. So again, we see that three carbon building block. In this case, though, instead of three fatty acids, they contain two fatty acids. The third fatty acid is going to be replaced by a phosphate group, which is another one of our important functional groups. So when you look at the overall construction of a phospholipid, you see two fatty acid chains down here. Right? We have one of those fatty acid chains is saturated in this case because it's got all carbon to carbon single bonds. And this other chain in this case is unsaturated because of this carbon to carbon double bond. Those fatty acid chains are hydrophobic. They're going to not interact with water. We have the glycerol molecule, which is here, the three carbon alcohol. And then the additional group, the group that's different here, is the phosphate group. I'm just going to circle that up at the top. The phosphate group it attaches to that third carbon on the glycerol, where the uh, fatty acid would be on a triglyceride. Um, so in, in, instead of that, we have the phosphate group, and then on top of the phosphate group, there is a nitrogen group. Now, the phosphate and the nitrogen group combined make a very polar hydrophilic head. Phosphate groups are extremely polar and hydrophilic. So we can, we can sort of do a, a shorthand notation for a phospholipid kind of this way. You typically see that in diagrams that represent organic chemistry. Now, one thing that's really unique and interesting about phospholipids is they have these very distinct nonpolar tails, hydrophobic nonpolar tails, and but they also have that very strong hydrophilic polar head. A molecule that contains both polar and nonpolar components, or hydrophobic and hydrophilic components, is referred to as amphipathic. So phospholipids have this unique ability to both interact with water at the phosphate head group and also to sort of repel water or not interact with water in the hydrophobic region. And this, what this is what makes the phospholipids great for constructing uh, cell membranes. As you see here, the hydrophobic region it forms the interior portion of the cell membrane. When we have phospholipids lined up tail to tail like this, here you can see the heads up at the top, the phospholipid tails, and then the tails of the next layer down here, and then the heads at the bottom. So the hydrophobic region serves as the barrier between the watery areas and then the, the watery areas which serve as either the interior of the cell or the extracellular environment will interact with those phosphate heads.
This uh, diagram that you're seeing here is a, a beautiful cross-section drawing of a cell membrane, and you can see again the construction of the phospholipids. Here we have one layer of phospholipids running across the top here, so I'm just going to sort of follow that. This is a single layer of phospholipids here going all the way across. And then there is another layer of phospholipids that's lined up with its sort of tails sticking up towards the other layer. So we call the, the cell membrane uh, the phospholipid bilayer because there are two layers of these phospholipids. And again, you can think here the outside of the cell, which is going to be a watery environment, and the inside of the cell, which will be a watery environment, are going to face those hydrophilic phosphate heads. And the interior, the hydrophobic parts, form that, that barrier that prevents interacting uh, with the phosphate heads, or with the water, rather. All right, the final kind of lipids that we're going to briefly discuss here are steroids. Uh, steroid molecules are very distinctive. They are essentially hydrophobic, ring-shaped molecules. As you can see here, there are two typical examples. Cholesterol is one. Cholesterol is found in the cell membrane. We'll talk about the purpose of cholesterol as we get into cells a little later in the semester. Another example of a steroid is testosterone. These are both examples of what we would call hormones that are engaged in regulating cellular activities. And the big idea that you need to understand about lipids, uh, rather about steroids, is that they're ring-shaped. They're not like triglycerides, but they still are uh, hydrophobic molecules made up mostly of carbon and hydrogen. All right, so that's a quick rundown on the organic chemistry of lipids. That was screencast session four. If you had any questions, things that you didn't understand or that you need a little bit more explanation on, please make sure that you've recorded those into your notes. And then we'll be spending the next couple of days in class discussing lipids, talking about lipids, learning lipid chemistry, sort of doing some activities that will help you to reinforce your understanding. All right, this is Mr. Gale signing off. I'll see you in class.